Hey everybody, and welcome to another episode of Book HQ. So today I'm gonna to be talking about A Wrinkle in Time, the movie. I'm not gonna to go too much into like the plot because I already talked all about the plot of A Wrinkle in Time in my video of the book by Madeline Langley, which you can check out over here. I'm gonna talk about the movie. The movie's a Disney film. I was anticipating it with bated breath ever since I saw the trailer for it. Ava DuVernay is at the helm, and it's kind of a mixed bag, honestly. There are some things about it which are really, really good. And there are some things about it which I have so many questions. First thing is that Charles Wallace, Meg's younger brother, is adopted in the film for some reason. I'm not sure why. I'm not really sure what that added to the story. The other thing is that I was watching this film and I was like, first five minutes, I was like, okay, they're gonna show up at some point. I know they don't go with them on the big adventure, but they were quite a big part of the story. 20 minutes in, I was like, okay. Where are this girl's other siblings? Meg's other siblings, the twins, do not feature in the film at all. Don't know why. Then there's a, a romance between Meg and Calvin, which is kind of strange, you know, because they're young. I mean, they're really young. I mean, I didn't think it was strange, but they are young. So it was like the first sort of introductory scene we see of Calvin and he's like, uh, thirsty. And I was looking at him the whole time and I was like, I know this guy, I've seen him before. Where do I know him from? He has a thing for Meg. And Meg presumably has a thing for him too, which is cute. I, I definitely have no problems with that. The thing that was like why for me about Calvin was that his story was not really explained properly. So like, why did this guy come on the trip? And in the book, it's explained that Charles Wallace, he's, you know, a great mind and he's super intelligent and he also has incredible emotional intelligence, right? And Calvin, apparently in the book, is that way too, but he masks it so that he can fit in at school and like in his regular life, right? But in the movie this is not explained so he's gonna come along with us on, on this adventure and Charles Wallace is like because we need your diplomacy skills I never saw him use any diplomacy skills and he also just kind of didn't even really seem to know like that he is um just as special as Charles Wallace was so none of that was explained and I was like mm, okay so to somebody who hasn't read the book they're like why is this guy along for the ride like why there's a, a scene in the trailer where you see the mom and Meg they're using a string and a toy ant and they're explaining about folding time and space and that's what tessering is and i didn't see this scene anywhere in the film i actually watched the film twice because the first time i watched the movie i didn't see the scene i was like okay maybe i just spaced out and i didn't see it so i went to watch the film again and i didn't see it. it's not there the other thing about calvin also is that like in the book we hear about like his mom and like how his family generally doesn't really care too much about him and he feels a little bit sad about that but in the movie it's like he has this verbally abusive dad also not a game changer then in the film they add an antagonist for meg at the school nicole so Nicole and her, like her posse of mean girls are like picking on her, I guess because her father's missing and she's an easy target. I I'm not sure. And it turns out that Nicole is her next door neighbor as well. So at the end of the film, Nicole sees that Meg's father, Dr. Murray comes back and then she sees Meg with Calvin and there's obviously chemistry. And so then Nicole waves. So then I'm like, why is she waving? Like, what's happening here? Is she deciding not to be a jerkwad anymore because she's seen that um, Meg's dad has come back? Or does Meg deserve to be treated like a human being now just because she's with Calvin? Does like Calvin give her street cred? I wasn't sure what that was or what that meant or why it was. Then, the misses. I mean, I feel like the misses were very much like the misses in the book. Although, Mrs. Watson in the movie for some reason is very like... I don't really believe in Meg and like uh, just so doubtful and so unconvinced of Meg's potential and which wasn't in the book really and then the happy medium this is another like romance that just sprung up in the movie which wasn't in the book in the book the happy medium is a woman but in the movie for some reason they made it a man and the man and Mrs. Watson have some kind of romantic something and I was like why did this add to the story like why why but again also not a game changer Let's skip ahead to Kamazots. Ta-da! And this is where I had major problems with the movie because nothing is explained and so nothing makes sense. First of all, they get there. They meet all the kids doing everything at the same time with the balls, but they don't explain the significance of that. So the scenes go on. They end up at a beach and they meet the red. In this scene, there's also a movie trailer scene where you see him in a suit talking to them and he looks badass. But we don't see this in the movie. He's never in a suit. He's kind of like in colorful beach clothes and then he takes off his glasses and we see his eyes are red so I was like okay not th that scene also just evaporated it's so different their experience on camazots in the movie than it is in the book in the book they arrive at camazots they see this boy who's like delivering mail they kind of have a conversation with him 
and he explains to them about all the rules. There are these rules in Camelot that are followed by everybody, and everybody in Camelot does everything the same. They're all the same, they do everything the same. At the same time, there's kind of like this mind control situation going on, and that's because of it. When they find out at the end that it actually is an evil dark brain, he wants to control everybody. He wants everybody to relinquish their free will, and he will take care of everything for them, control them, basically. But they don't explain this in the movie, and so the ways in which he controls is through repetition and rhythm. So which is what the bouncing of the balls at the same time is. And then when they do finally meet the red guy in the building in the, in the book, and there's a dinner table laid out for them, it's not a, on the beach, like a picnic basket like it was in the movie, there's a kind of long dialogue where he's explaining to them that like the rhythm is a big part of being able to control people. The red actually takes control of Charles Wallace, who's really the person that they want, and he does it through this repetitive like multiplication this times this is this, this times this is this, and Meg actually runs into the little boy and he drops and he hits his head and then he like comes right. But then the red guy gets him again and just before she can knock him again, um, the red guy like beats her up and whatever he does, she's not able to do it again. None of that was in the movie. So in the movie, they're like on the beach, dude just starts multiplying. People who haven't read the book are like, what is happening? And then Charles Wallace just changes, turns and is like, I hate you all and I'm going with the red guy. And then like in the movie also, the red explains about how everything in the world is fabricated, nothing is real. So like even the food isn't really food, it tastes like crap, but it looks like food because people need sustenance. That's not explained in the movie. In the movie, it's like they're eating food, Charles Wallace says it tastes like sand, they're all like, you're crazy. Then a sandwich that Calvin is holding dissolves into sand and then yeah, they just leave it at that. And again, people who haven't read the book are like, what is happening? Then they go and they, they meet it, finally. And that was super disappointing because it was like, what is this? In the book, it's like a brain, like a brain sitting on a table. But in the movie, it's like, I kind of felt like that scene at the, in Guardians of the Galaxy 2 where you see what ego is really like in that big like brain center. That's what it looked like. And if Charles Wallace hadn't said that this is the darkest mind in the world, you wouldn't really know that that's a brain that they're in because it's so vague and kind of ambiguous what that is. I obviously knew because I've read the book, but again, people who have read the book are sitting there like, what is happening? I think that was the main problem with the film is that like, so many things were just not properly explained. And I feel like when a book is being adapted to a movie, there are two main things to consider. The first thing is that the story and the stuff that you're gonna include in the movie need to be things that somebody who hasn't read the books, who has no sort of history with like the details and stuff from the books will be able to understand. And the other thing is that people who have read the books want to see the book come to life. Don't really want your interpretation. Sometimes that works out well, like it did with the texting in Everything Everything, where they would like meet in her models and talk instead of us just reading texts. That worked out well. That was kind of a, a change. These kinds of interpretive changes don't always work. And I feel like that's kind of the issue with A Wrinkle in Time, the movie, is that like so many of these interpretive changes didn't translate to me who's read the book and certainly meant nothing to people who hadn't read the book. Like I was in my video where I talked about A Wrinkle in Time, I said, oh, I can't wait to see them go to that planet where the beasts don't have um, sight or the concept of sight doesn't exist there. And you know, this whole part, this big part in the book is condensed to like a second where the happy medium is going with Meg to, to trace the path that her father took when he tessered and you see that planet and you see the beast sort of in the distance for like a second and he's like oh hey look there's ant beast and then they move on and I, I was just like what is why you know if you were gonna make it so small a section you could have just excluded it altogether because again somebody who hasn't read the book doesn't know what that reference is or what that means it means nothing but like i said the the graphics were incredible definitely see it on the biggest screen that you possibly can the only thing with the graphics is that the graphics were beautiful and incredible and amazing and the world building was incredible, but it was also very detached from the characters. It was like behind them, just sort of just like a beautiful backdrop that they didn't really get to interact with and we didn't really get to see its full potential. Those were some of my issues with the film. I am somebody who the fantasy fiction genre is made for. Like I am the person that that genre is pandering to and I will gobble all and everything up. I've watched and read most fantasy fiction. This is the first one I've ever seen where the girl protagonist is a girl of color so like I'm all for it and I'm 
definitely happy to recommend everybody to go and watch the film just because of that alone. I mean, I think the film was really good already, but it just could have been so much better. And I think, because a lot of people were saying like, oh, it's this other big film that came out at the same time or just before it that's stealing this film's thunder. No, they didn't need anybody's help to fall. It does so on its own by just this thing I talked about where you're setting things up and just leaving them unexplained to people who haven't read the books. And for people who have read the books, we're like, why didn't you go further into that? Like for the, the fact that the books focus so much on science and like the story takes place in the fifth dimension. In this one, they didn't even really talk about that. They talked about, oh, folding and love, and that was it. And in the in the book, they talk about, oh, the first dimension is, and then if you fold the paper, it's the second dimension, and the, you know, you fold it five times, and that's how they explain the multiverse and the other universes and tessering. In this one, they talk about tesseract, they just drop it on us, don't really say much about it. And those people who have a history with Marvel already, like our Marvel fans, when you hear tesseract, this is what you think of. Those are kind of the problems, the main problems that this film had is that just like setting up things, not really explaining them. The audience can't even do the work for themselves because they just don't really have the, the background knowledge or the reference or anything for that work to be done. But I mean, I'm still recommending it for everybody to watch. Like I said, it's great to see a, an adventure story with a girl in it, a girl of color, and there's a handsome boy who's like crazy about her and goes on this great adventure with her. And you also see Meg kind of going from being broken and finding herself and making sense of the world around her. And that's always a great story to watch. I feel like that appeals to many people because we kind of sometimes all find ourselves like that. Go out and watch it. Possibly read the book before so that it makes more sense. But if you don't, watch this video and recommend this video to other people so that when they watch it and they're like, what was that? Why was that not explained? They can come here and get some answers. You will come away from this film with one word, underwhelmed. It is used a noticeable amount of times in this film. This is the word of the film, underwhelmed, underwhelming. I really loved Oprah's makeup. Oh, I was just coveting that, that one orangey type of um, lipstick that she had on. I'd very much like to hear what you think of the movie if you've watched it or if you've read the book. And please subscribe to my channel if you haven't already subscribed. Really appreciate the support. Thank you for watching this video. To the end it was a long one, but thank you. And until next time, keep reading and keep watching. Bye-bye.